Hello everyone and welcome to the channel. I'm Emmanuel, I'm a former Boeing 737 pilot and welcome to the iFly Boeing 737 MAX 8. Before we start, a little note over here. The version you're seeing on this video is a pre-release version. That means not everything may represent the final product that's going to release to the market. Now, for those of you who only got introduced to the channel since I transitioned to the A330, the 737 was actually my first aircraft that I flew for an airline. Initially the 700 and 800 and then later on the MAX as well. However, I do have about 100 hours on the MAX, which is not all that much, but then again isn't nothing as well. So I do have a little bit of an idea of the MAX, though of course not as good as of the NG. Well, with that out of the way, let's go ahead and step into the aircraft and have a look at what is new, what is old, and what we are going to enjoy the most. So this is the 737 MAX cockpit, and I do have to say iFly did put quite a good amount of work into this one. So, a couple of new things of course, like the screens that we have right in front of us, Couple of old things like the overhead panel that, however, does have a couple of changes on the 737 MAX compared to the 737 NG, which we are going to go over in probably a dedicated video of changes between the two aircraft types. What's also new with the iFly is a brand new and high detailed cabin, which we are going to have a look at a little bit later on in some greater detail, but rest assured they do have a good looking business class, they have a good looking economy class over here, and just to give credit where credit is due, the livery we are using today is the lot livery done by Steve Drabeck that you can download through the iFly manager. Now with that good stuff out of the way, I suggest that we are going to take a seat and going to start preparing to take the aircraft for flight. We are currently standing in Gdansk and we are going to do a quick flight, about 40 minutes, over to Warsaw, which is a real world 737 MAX service operated to this morning by LOT. Now let's go ahead and power up the electronic flight back because we do have a couple of things that we want to have a look at in here. So the EFB you've got over here is basically the old Boeing Class 3 EFB that got shipped with some aircraft. It is a rather outdated system, we have to be that honest and upfront, but nonetheless they did mimic a real world EFB over here. So. I guess it's somewhat of a good compromise there. So let's hit the initialize flight button and the first thing we're going to do is just to go over a couple of uh, menus over there. So let's go to system page down here and you can see going into the sim menu that we have quite a lot of options over there. On the ACAS tab you can enter your sim brief ID which can be used to uplink flight plans and then we do have some failure options over here. For example you can see we've got rather lots of uh, menus over here and since I know someone is going to ask, I have not checked if they modeled that famous MCAS failure, but since Boeing fixed it, I kind of think that they probably shouldn't. Okay, so apart from that, what's really nice is that you've got the random failure option as well, so that adds a little bit of immersion to it. And then we have a lot of different other options. So we've got save and load, where you can save and load panel states. Then we have the panel style, which is where you can change all the options. For example, going into the autopilot over here, we've got things like the roll mode on takeoff, whether it's heading select or wings level. We can set bank limits and we got a lot of options down here as well. For example, whether we want the VNAV alt option installed on the aircraft or not, whether we want... Um, automatic thrust reduction after takeoff and so on. So there's really a lot of options that you can set in here. Now, if we go ahead to um, further systems, then we do have a pushback facility in here as well. And then we do have the ground support, which is basically adding and removing things like the uh, trucks that we can set over here, or we can, for example, um, connect an external power unit, a fuel truck, and so on. And those two we are going to call for right now because number one, I do want external power for powering the aircraft up a little bit later on. But number two, we want to make use of the refueling feature of the aircraft. Now, if we go ahead then and just have a look at all the other options available, you can see that there are really loads of them over here. So in terms of visuals and in terms of visual options, iFly have certainly included a lot of stuff over here. 
Now next up if you go to the refuel panel that's quite cool. So this basically has all the switches and entries you can make on the actual refueling panel underneath the wing of the 737 MAX. So for example we can include our desired fuel quantities over here then turn on the valves and when the fuel truck adds pressure then the thing is just going to start to refuel. Now, we are gonna try the system in a few moments, but before we do that, we want to power up the aircraft, so there's always that. In terms of the doors, we can control them over here, but we can also click them right in the cabin, and that is something that I want to show you right now. So, if we just go back over here into the cabin, we can see that the one left door has already opened because of the jetway that is connected over here, but if we just have a look at the one right for example then you will notice that there are a couple of things modeled over here that I really need to see so we got three different click spots on the door that is number one up here the um, strap then you've got the door handle and then down here you have the gird bar which is actually what you use to arm and disarm the uh, slides so that's quite a cool thing to have that down here now we are gonna go over some more details about those in a future video because I want to keep this one kind of dedicated to flying the aircraft. Alright, so with all of those things now checked out, let's go ahead and actually turn the aircraft on and let's go ahead and actually get to do a little bit of uh, piloting stuff over here. So we're gonna start just like we did in my old airline by um, standing over here and first thing first, battery is coming on and the external power is gonna come on as well. And with that, the aircraft will start powering up. These screens will need a little bit to power up. You can change that in the settings, whether you want that realistic or not, so that's quite cool to know. Now from here on, emergency exit lights are gonna go to armed, attendant call button check, then let's go ahead and check the takeoff config warning system, do the um, fire test, that was interesting, I just set it to the fault detection position. That should not trigger an actual fire detection test. Only when I put it to the right, to the overheat fire position. That is what should trigger the test. Make sure that you can disarm that bell, and then also check the um, squibs down there. Okay, that's our um, cargo fire extinguisher checked. Then let's go to the overhead panel. So, over here, we're gonna start with that flight recorder to the test position and back to the normal position now that should have triggered something okay looks like that is not simulated then The stick shaker should only work after four minutes, but normally what you get when you are just pressing it like this is just a small movement of the, of the control column. So that is something, well, they, you can operate it a little bit earlier in here it seems, but, well, kind of still looking for the right compromise, because PMDG didn't do it correctly either, so neither did iFly. However, something iFly did is that y when you are pressing on all those lights, they actually do illuminate just like they do on the real Boeing 737 MAX and NG. Alright, so let's take a seat then. That is our safety rainbow completed and we are going to start with a little bit of some system setup over here. So right now we have 2.5 tons of fuel on board. We will need a little bit more. Now, I did not find any option to view a flight plan inside the cockpit. If you guys know of one, then please do let me know, but I couldn't find any in here. So. I will just use my iPad for um, showing the flight plan and we'll just keep the um, EFB as it is for that part. Now, in terms of the fuel for this flight, we are going to take um, 4,000 kilos. So let's go over to the systems over here. Let's go to refuel and we are looking for a desired fuel of um, 2,000 kilos for the um, number one and number two tanks, which are the two wing tanks, number one left, number two right. Then let's go ahead and turn that um, valve on. Hit set. 
And now it starts the refueling process, as you can see down here. So that is pretty cool. Something I did not find is a payload manager where I could set my payload. So I just went up here to the weight and balance menu and set my payload over here. Even though I do hope that I've just missed it, but not 100% sure. Alright, so refueling is in progress down here, which is good to see. And with that on the way, let's go ahead and start working ourselves through the FMC. The FMC is quite similar to the Boeing 737 and GFMC, with a couple of small changes, some of which we are going to explore today. So let's go ahead and start right up here on the item page. So we've got a 737-8 with a 27k engine. We have an IREX cycle that is slightly out of date, but... Let's not worry about that just yet. Okay, onto the position in it page, and we are going to get our GPS position from here. Include that, and then onto the route page. Now, we are going to enter the flight plan manually over here, as my former 737 operator used to do. But um, you do have a flight plan uplink option available as well. So we're going from Danzig towards Warsaw, Echo Papa Whiskey Alpha, and our flight number is going to be the lot... 8 Victor Romeo. Okay, so just a quick eye on our refueling now since it should stop with 4000 kilos on board, but let's just monitor that. And this looks perfect. So 4000 kilos of fuel on board, let's go ahead. Okay, it looks like the valves shut off automatically. So that is perfect. Refueling is completed then. Okay, so back into the FMC. So, departure arrival. We're going to depart runway 29er and we are flying on the Ealoon to Hotel departure. From there on, it's going to be via November 133 towards Gruda and then November 191. Oh, what's that? Did it just kill my route? So November 133, and then November 191. Oh, well that's got to be a bug. Normally the aircraft should just find the um, waypoint automatically and, and then just link them up. But let's see if we can enter that stuff ourselves. So if we go to Gruda over here, then November 1901. Okay, that seems to work. In the real one, you don't need to enter the waypoint. It's going to find the intersection automatically. But, well, that's something that they're hopefully going to fix. Okay, so, and then on to Sorex. So, for the arrival, we are going to fly the ILS Yankee approach to runway 33. We've got the Sorex 5 uniform arrival via the Whiskey Alpha 534 transition. Okay, and then we can hit activate. Right, on to the performance in it. Cost NX6, I'll just really keep it close to my former operator there. And then the reserves are going to be 2,000 kilos. Zero fuel weight is planned as 57.5 today, typical zero fuel weight for a 737 MAX, 160 guests on board today. Flight level 270, the average wind is going to be 323 at 12. ISA deviation, um, let's see, we've got minus 40 degrees up there, 27,000 feet. I don't have to calculate that stuff manually, unfortunately, but I'll tell you what. I can just enter the top of climb OET as well, that's easier. Okay, minus 40. Alright, transition altitude 6501. And that's it, okay. So, nothing over here yet, and on the second takeoff page we're going to do an acceleration at 1000 feet. Okay, so down to the legs page, and over here we can check our sit. So let's go ahead and have a look at our charts. Terminal charts, use airports from FMS, complete. Okay. Where are my charts? I don't get any charts over here. That's interesting. When I first When I loaded the plane for the first time, just to check out a couple of the options before recording the video, I didn't take it flying yet, but um, when I loaded it for the first time, it did ask me to connect my Navigraph, but looks like... Let's see if we can find any of those manually. 
Echo Papa Golf Delta. Still Trident. Gdansk. Hm. No charts. Okay. Well, then we'll have to do without. Does the airport map work? Center on aircraft position? No. Interesting. Does the performance work? Just to see if anything works at all. Copy FMC data. Let's keep that stuff. Flops 5, air conditioning on, anti-ice off. And let's just enter something over here, just for a little test calculation. 62 tons and CG, I don't know, 24. Calculate. Yeah, that works. Okay. Well, interesting. Um, I guess. I guess we're just gonna keep it at that for now. Um, but anyway, looks like we found the looks like we found the uh, payload manager. So over here we can set the MSFS payload as well. That's quite cool. So. Um, yeah, I suppose we're just gonna leave it at that for now, shall we? Okay, anyway, zero fuel weight 57.4, which is almost what we entered. That's fine. Okay, well, I'm just gonna leave the um, SID as it is then. Maybe we'll find out about that later on. Speed restriction, well, 250 below 100. Shouldn't that show me 220? Yeah, it should. Maybe if I want to execute it. No. Okay, well, this should show me the next active speed restriction. And not the 250 below 100, so we should see 220 over here. But okay, we'll just leave it at that for now. Okay, so root copy, that's quite cool. And now finally let's enter our engine outset. And let's check if we can actually enter custom waypoints in here. So on the 737, if you go to the waypoint island and you enter, for example, um, GDNX2, and if once it doesn't know that waypoint, you can then enter it via latitude and longitude down here. So that is quite cool. And something you can do to make that stuff a little bit easier is, um, for example, you enter the waypoint Echo Papa Golf Delta, then the runway track 290/25. So now we're qu creating a um, PVD point down here. And let's just go ahead and execute that for now. And now let's take that waypoint. Echo Papa Golf 01. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what, since we only had the option to enter coordinates here, that problem kind of solved itself. I was about to create a PBD based waypoint, but looks like they only simulated latitude, longitude. I don't have those available right now, so. Suppose we are just going to leave it at that. Okay, um, then let's continue on, I'd say. I'll tell you what. Let me just see if I can get hold of those coordinates. I'm working off screen on my real world EFB right now. But looks like I can't. Okay, well, that's not a problem. Don't have data for um, Gdansk on my real world EFB since we kind of don't fly there on the A330. Okay, well, in that case, I'm just going to leave the FMS as it is. Well, I might just go to the, I just go to the back here, enter a random waypoint to create the discontinuity, delete that, execute, hold, enter that point, and that's going to be 290 right hand turns, and we're going to climb 3000 to stay above the MSA. Okay, that way we've entered the engine outset at the end of the um, page. Now, last but not least, we could go ahead and enter the 25-mile ring around the airport just for that additional MSA awareness. So, if we have a quick look at our ND now, let's go ahead and shift that over just to check what the SIP looks like. Then here's what we got. So, straight ahead, and then it is a left turnout like this, couple of waypoints, and then we are at Yaloon already. All right, excellent. So optimum 401, 
Cruise 270 and let's see what the trip altitude is on the performance page. Okay, it actually doesn't suggest one. Well, that's fine. Happy with that. We're just gonna leave it as it is for now. Let's do the panel scan next then. So, your damper on, nav transfer display switch is normal auto, fuel pumps are coming on. Then we can test the crossfeed valve. Well, that was pretty quick. Should take a little bit longer than that. Okay, so, cabin utility and IFE coming on, and then... We're just gonna keep those two off, but the fasten belt's coming on. Okay, window heat on, hydraulic pumps on, and unfortunately no flight recorder modeled over here. That is default equipment on anything flying around in Europe, so I do hope they are gonna add that flight recorder switch with a future update. In any case, let's continue our setup. Flight level 270 in here for the airport. Oh, for the destination field elevation, you can just go down here, take the runway point, subtract 50, and then you know what your destination field elevation is. So we're looking at 300 for today's flight. Position lights on. We don't have maintenance here, so we are going to use the right side anyway, because it is the first flight of the day. And then down to our NAFTIS, oh, sorry, to our EFIS control panel. We are going to use hectopascals, and we will have the airport and the traffic. And... Let's see. We'll yeah, we'll take traffic as well. Okay, perfect. Then on to the MCP. The flight director switches are gonna come on. We're going to do an initial climb to let's say five thousand feet in here. Now, something I did find a little bit strange on the iFly Max is that it seems to have some sort of acceleration in here. You can see how it changes in steps of five hundred. The real 737 doesn't have that. On the real one, it goes in steps of 100, regardless of how quick you turn. Now, you may like that or not, because it might make it easier to dial something in. Personally, I'm not so much of a fan of that feature, but um, I can see how some people may like it, so let's just keep it at that. So on the courses, we'll set the runway track, which is going to be 287. Then let's move down here, light test. And that's all looking good. Alright, that's looking good. Then we'll move further down. Fuel flow, reset, and let's bring back the let's bring back the um, engine page as well. In my um, former airline it was SOP that you keep that page on the pilot flying side, so we are going to keep this on our side for today's flight. So, auto brakes RTO, and a quick look over the systems as well, looking normal. And then for the down frequencies, we are going to tune 1 to 2 decimal 8 today. Again, over here you also have that um, strolling acceleration in which I find a little bit annoying. However, it does make it easier to um, put a frequency in, but I don't know. Suppose that's personal taste, whether you like it or not. Well, we are just going to keep the VOR on something. Squawk. 2000 TCAS above and altitude off is now selected. So, source number one and transponder standby on the ground. Listening to VHF left and, or VHF one and two. And we're going to do that on both sides, of course. And the third one should be on data. Like that. All right, perfect. So that basically concludes our flight deck setup. Now, small personal note over here, I do find those displays to be a little bit bright, so let's go ahead and dim them. In the real airplane, when you put the switch in the middle position, then they are going to go into an automatic brightness that is going to adjust with um, daylight position, or rather with um, ambient light, that is how I should call it. So let's just set them right over there and uh, see if that's modeled. Okay, so the right panel can be set up as well, and that's it. Now, something that you may notice is on the 737 MAX, you always have the uh, water display on. And that is actually not a bug, that is a feature. Um, the real one didn't have that option to um, not show the water. On the real one, the water is standard. Okay, and that concludes our panel setup. So, 
That stuff is done. I suppose we're gonna skip over the briefing in order not to drag the video out, so let's just go ahead and do our performance calculation and then our takeoff data. So from the PMDG I'm kinda used just to click next to this and look at that, it actually does update the zero fuel weight if you just click onto it. So we've got 57.3, which is 200 kilos down, 61.3 is our takeoff weight. Well, and then let's go right over into the um, performance manager. So we are, we are going to keep the default. You can see our center of gravity is pretty good over here. So we're looking at about 20%. Okay, then let's go right back over here. And it's actually automatically entered the, the numbers. Interestingly enough, it entered the winds in meters per second rather than knots. Now, if I need to take an educated guess, iFly is a Chinese company. In China, they use meters per second for the wind. So I suppose... That is what happened there. Okay, um, let's just copy that FMC data one more time. QNH 1010 is correct. For the rating, well, unfortunately, we can't go auto over here. Let's try takeoff 2. And we get um, D rate 2 with 38 degrees. So you got D rate 2, 38 degrees. And that's 80.3 and 1, which we have down here 80.5. Well, there should be a little bit of a difference of about 0 0.8 because we don't have the APU running yet and if the, if the bleed system is not pressurized then the FMS is going to assume a bleeds off takeoff and therefore it would indicate a higher N1 to you. So you would expect somewhat of a difference if you have selected air conditioning on which is the default that you do in the 737 MAX. So there should have been somewhat of a difference there, which unfortunately doesn't seem to be modeled. But okay, let's not dwell over that and let's keep on going. So it is a flaps 5 takeoff. The CG is... Oh, it trimmed itself automatically. Interesting. That's probably a nice, um, a nice quality of life feature that iFly have implemented there. Obviously the real one does not do that automatically. Okay, it speeds 135, 135, 141, and we've got 35, 35, 41. So let's accept those, and 141 going into the MCP as well. Okay, perfect. So that good stuff is all in. In that case, I suppose we are going to fire up the APU. Now note that you don't have an EGT indicator for the APU in the 737 MAX anymore, because you kind of don't need that stuff. Um, once the APU is ready, you're going to see the APU um, generator of bus light illuminate, and that's it. And if any malfunction cures, you still have the warning lights up here, so there's not all that much to worry about. Okay, so... You can't really monitor the APU performance unless you go into the maintenance panels. Um, but I'm not going to bother with that right now. No, <laughs> let's not bother with that. Talk about maintenance panels on the system page. You should normally have a little page down here where you can access maintenance stuff. But let's just keep it at that, shall we? Alright, so let's get rid of the systems panel. Don't really need that. Wait until the APU is started, and in the meantime, I'm going to call for GSX to prepare my position for pushback and departure. So, for the sake of it, let's just go back to the cabin. Alright, the door has been closed. They are disconnecting the jetway right now. And once the door is closed, we are going to place the strap down here, and then put the good bar. Wait a moment. Oh, it armed itself automatically. Didn't mean to open that door. Okay, you're gonna close again. Interesting that they didn't model the gust lock because you have that high quality model of the door already. All right, looks like the good bar is armed automatically when I place the, tr the strap in position. So you can see down here, the flight attendants have to take that thing down here and hang it into here. The way this works is if the door is now open, then this thing is getting pulled out. And that kind of fires the slide, which is in that little box you see down here. Okay, well, we're just going to keep it at that. So let's go back into the flight deck. Close that cockpit door. And let's take a seat. By the way, as we're waiting for GSAX to prepare ourselves for the pushback, a little 
fun thing over here. If we look into the um, locker, they do have the coat over here, which is a good thing, but why on earth do they have this one? I mean, is any pilot doing striptease in the flight deck and taking off their shirt? I surely hope not. Um, well, let's keep it at that, shall we? Back to the captain's seat. Okay, APU generator is coming online, then we can disconnect all the ground equipment. So, system page, ground support. Well, first things first, the park and brake is set. So, clear the trucks, disconnect external, disconnect the fuel truck, and hit set. Perfect. Okay. So, here we go. Well, then, I suppose we are going to do the procedures. First of all, no smoking sign goes to auto since our passengers are seated. And then, packs off, APU bleed on, anti-collision on. Okay, and with that, we are ready to go. Well, and the transponder into auto as well. So, just a quick check on those transponder options over here, since that is a slightly different transponder from what we had in um, my former airline. So, I suppose we are going to select the XP and the R position. No, actually, with auto over here and out off over here, that is the correct position for ground operation. Okay, perfect. So, master caution, air conditioning, dual bleed, that's expected. Clearing that one away. Well, and then we are good to go. So, ground from flight deck, go ahead. Please confirm, doors and hatches closed, ground equipment removed, and bypass pin is installed. That's all confirmed. Roger, we clear the push, facing east, park and brake, released. Start the pushback, and you're clear to start engines at any time. Roger, commencing engine start. Okay, engine 2 start. The reason I'm starting the engines straight away is because the max engines, the Leap um, 1B engines, do take a little while. To actually start up so what we'll see is the n2 is going to go up to yep around about here into the motoring and once it once it's completed the motoring process which is dependent on the temperature inside the engines normally in the morning when the engine is cold it's going to go rather quick but once the motoring is clear and it reaches 25 percent n2 then we're going to turn on the fuel and that is how you do it on the 737 max the engines are pretty quiet so don't expect to hear a lot over here well, yes, do expect to hear a lot, but please only the airline, not the engines. So, 25%. Fuel on. Check the valves moving. And you'll see the self-test over here. So, they might be flickering a little bit. And now the engine start commences, and that's how it should be. Okay, pushback completed, set park and brake. Park and brake set. Okay, good start on two, starting one. So, once again, N2 is going to run up. Eventually, it will go into the uh, bow rotor motoring, which is going to be indicated by a uh, motoring in the N2 gauge, like this. And when that happens, N2 should more or less maintain a constant value. And what the airplane does is basically to make sure that the heat is distributed appropriately inside the engine. And the electronic engine control automatically determines how long that needs to take based on the temperature of the engine. Since we are doing the first sector of the day, it's gonna go rather quick, but there can be engine starts up to like two and a half minutes and stuff like that, so something to keep in mind here. Right, once again, we will see the engine valve closed light flash since the um, EEC is going to run an automatic self-test. Does it only do that on the first engine of the day? Not 100% sure. It might. It might. I'm not going to say that anything is a bug over here because um, it's been it's been a year and a half since I flew the Max, so I'm not gonna 
I'm not gonna say something certain over there. What you do notice though is that the um, Leap 1B engine does run rather hot during the engine start, and the N2 is about 70%, so it's a little bit hotter or a little bit um, faster than the N than the CFM56 engine on the 737NG. Okay, so he's already running away. Perfect. Then let's go ahead and run the um, after start procedures. And we're gonna go flaps five. Okay, flight control track. Full up, full down, neutral, full left, full right, neutral, rudder, full left, full right, neutral. Okay then, so. Once I release the parking brake, I expect the aircraft to start accelerating pretty quickly. The MAX is known to have a very high idle thrust and it accelerates past 30 knots easily. Especially at such a light weight as we have it today. So, parking brake released. <laughs> and nothing happens. Just to be sure that I'm not accidentally standing in the pedals here. No. That is brakes applied. That is brakes released. The plane should really start going fast now. Alright, let's add a little bit of breakaway thrust. Maybe it's just that. So now we have a bit of speed. Let's go back to idle. And now it looks better. Now it is accelerating in idle. It should kind of have done that from a complete stop here, without the need for um, breakaway thrust, but that might be an MSFS bug here. I do recall that other developers have had problems with that as well. Alright, so... Around the corner over here, then we're gonna go to the left again. Clear right side, clear left side. The plane feels pretty responsive here on taxi. Now, I have to admit, um... It's been a long, long time since I dealt with any of that stuff in the 737, so if I'm making the smallest possible inputs, I'm... Well, let's zoom out a bit so that you can see my control inputs here. So just a very small input to the left. The plane does respond to it rather quickly. Feels a bit like the PMDG here, which is also very, very direct in the controls. Something I never really liked, but um, I suggest if you just do small inputs, then it kind of works. Alright, in any case, let's go ahead and do the takeoff config check. Oh, those engines responded very quickly. They shouldn't do that. Normally, if you just do this, then um, basically the engines don't respond at all if you are quick enough. So, literally this, there should be no response, let alone have him run up that high. Alright, so proper taxi technique for the 737 MAX. Um, it's quite similar to the Airbus, the aircraft is equipped with carbon brakes as well. So you let it accelerate all the way up to 30 and then you break it back down to 10, let it accelerate again and that way the airplane um, doesn't use up too much of its braking energy and the brakes don't get too hot. You don't have a braking temperature indicator in most 737 Maxes. One is available from Boeing at extra cost and let's just face it, airlines don't like to pay that. Much rather, if the brakes do get too warm, you are going to feel it in the brakes when you are actually braking and you might hear that Chewbacca-like noise from the aircraft and that is your indicator that the brakes are too hot. Or not too hot, but very hot. So um, for that reason, you don't really need to break temperature indicator. 
Okay, so we're about to reach the end of the line here. I do have to admit I'm struggling a little bit to keep the airplane straight on the taxi line. At the very small tiller ranges it seems a little bit um, too touchy, but I'm gonna write to um, iFly about that, see if they can improve that. Look at that, taking a small turn is rather hard here. I'm really trying to do the smallest possible tiller input. Alright, cabin crew, prepare for departure. Oh no, we don't need the flash position here. But interesting to see that they modeled that. Only very few Maxes actually seem to have that. We'll have to go over the options again to see if we can deselect that. Alright. Ooh, that's full tiller input. Interesting. Well, we definitely overshot that one. Okay, this is looking better. Let's go ahead and get ourselves aligned. Looking good. Okay, take off. Engines are very, very quick to respond here. So where's the toga button? Here we go. So, N1 heading select toga. Starting the timer. Take off thrust set, indications normal. 80 knots, checked. B1 rotate. Well, that felt pretty easy to rotate. The real one is a little bit harder due to the elevator dead band, but that doesn't seem to be modeled here just yet. Okay, I'll now. So, what's that flight director commanding? Let's try and follow that. Okay, back up. Flaps one. Speed checked. Flaps one. By the way, very nice to see that uh, flap lever animation go right from 5 to 1 without putting it into the 2D tent. Because that really doesn't... Uh, you wouldn't do that in the real plane. Okay, flaps up. Speed checked. Flaps up. Flaps up, no lights. VNAV. Okay, let's climb to higher flight level here. Just something. Okay, set standard. Standard cross check, passing flight level 4-5. Now. Alright, so we're up in the air, and let's just climb all the way to cruise level 270. Set. So, coming up to the first turn, as mentioned, I haven't taken the plane into the air before, I haven't flown it yet, so I can't really um, tell you much of the flight dynamics until we've tried it out. The initial climb, however, seemed rather well. Pitch target is normally 15 degrees. We were, well, a little bit higher than that, but um, that was definitely okay. So, let's go for the left-hand turn here. My first impression of the real Max, when I flew it on the, for the first time, was that the aileron is actually a little bit more twitchy than it is on the NG. So, on my very first rotation, I kind of went a little bit um, left-right in some pilot-induced oscillations, just because it was a bit more twitchy. But, looks like over here it feels pretty solid. As you can see, I can fly that um, turn pretty much perfectly. Keep it right in the flight director, so that is pretty cool. Uh, 
Okay, let's roll it wings level again. Here we go. Okay, passing 10,000. So, lights are going off. We can release our passengers. And we can clean up the flight plan as well in a few moments. I'm gonna deal with that once the autopilot is on. I just wanna fly past that turn over here, do the acceleration up to the higher airspeed, because the flight dynamics of the 737 do change quite a bit with increasing airspeed. Always remember that the forces of your controls are directly influenced by the air going over it. And if you're flying fast, then obviously your controls are going to get more sensitive. And I want to see how well they have simulated that. The flight director should command a little bit further pitch down right now, because we are barely accelerating. Normally it should command a little bit greater acceleration. Look at that, if I keep flying the flight director, we barely accelerate at all. That should work quite a bit better. Let's see what it does in level flight. Just to show you, I'm right on the flight director. Almost nothing happens. It should look something like this. It should give us an acceleration like this. Okay, that is looking better. Rather slow climb speed over here, but I have to admit I barely flew any flight in the max that stayed at these very low levels, so I'm not sure about the climb speed um, and whether that is correct or not. My basic impression was that the max flies quite a bit faster than the NG does, so... I'm surprised to see the climb speed that low, but it might just be because of the low cruising altitude. Okay, autopilot engage. Even though I have to say that my basic um, expectation would have been that the airplane would have accelerated to a rather high indicated airspeed and then simply transitioned over to the climb mark number a little bit earlier. In the descent it's different, but we'll talk about that when we actually come to the descent. So let's not dwell over that just yet. Okay, so the autopilot is on. We can close that timer over here, since we have the elapsed timer that started automatically down here. And then let's quickly go over the FMS. So, Lex page. We are gonna delete that holding back here. What's that? I pressed delete, didn't I? Delete? Huh. Interesting. That's gotta be a bug. In the real one, if you just delete the waypoint associated with the holding, it deletes the holding as well. Okay, so, optimum 404, cruise 270, and we are thrust limited. Very nice to see that we have this indication. Alright, so we'll just stick with level 270 as calculated by um, Simbrief. And that is, by the way, also the level that the real flight took, so that makes the decision rather easy. Okay then, let's go ahead and take a little shortcut. Um, Let's fly direct to Sorex initially. So, Lax, Sorex, insert and execute. And here we go. Top of descent about 75 miles away. So let's just bring it up to the top of climb and then we'll start working on our descent and our approach preparation. I'll show you a couple of tricks from the um, 737 FMC that help you to do almost the entire setup. The only thing that you can't find is the uh, minimums in the FMC. But for the rest of it, why are we going left and right? The real 737 does those turns pretty well, so... Well. Okay, so, climbing rather well. Let's go ahead and have a look from the outside, since that does look pretty neat, doesn't it? Now something that I do really like about the aircraft over here is the sounds. 
they do seem to sound pretty accurate. Something, something that most most impressed me was when I did my very first flight on a Max, which actually was on a deadhead flight, so I wasn't operating flight crew, but I was deadheading on it. And I sat in the back of the cabin, quite close to the engines, and they... On the runway, they started to increase the thrust to a point where I thought, okay, now they must have set those 40%, and now they'll increase to takeoff thrust. But to my sheer surprise, the thrust simply stayed right there, and they didn't increase it any further, because the the max is so quiet that it only gives you the sound that the CFM engines give you on um, on ta on a taxi during takeoff and flight. So it is a really, really quiet engine. Okay, vertical speed, 2000. Now here's something interesting. We changed the vertical speed and it opened the speed went on map point 64, but on the PFD it went to 636. It shouldn't do that. It should just go to 64. Okay, 1000 to go. Vertical speed 1000. Pretty responsive. Probably a little bit too fast here. Okay, about to do our level off. And I forgot the auto brake in the RTO setting. You, you will see me forget a little bit of stuff like that occasionally from the controls that are not in the position where they are on the MG. It was the very same thing in the real plane. That's just, well, happens. Okay, according to Simbrief, the top of climb should be after 10 minutes of flight time and we should have 2,700 kilos of fuel on board. We are just about reaching the top of climb right now. 10 minutes in the air, that's accurate. And the fuel, 3,000, well, we uplifted about 100 kilos more, so I tend to say the fuel usage is more or less accurate from what I can see right now. Something I find really impressive on the MAX is that the fuel flow per engine is below 1,000 kilos for most weights in uh, cruise, even up at higher altitude. Around about approximately 1,000, just shy of it. Down here, of course, it is a little bit less since we are flying a little bit slower, so that's expected. Okay, so let's take a small shortcut here and fly direct to Repso. Like that. Execute. Now let's see how the airplane is going to take that turn. The real one is really good at these turns without overshooting into the other direction like it just did previously. But let's see how this one is going to perform. Yeah, look at that. 0 0.1 right. And now it's overshooting to get back on the route. Now that that's not realistic. It shouldn't do that. But we're back on the route, looking okay. Alright then, let's go ahead and start a little bit of our approach preparation. So we are going to start on the VNAV page, and going to the VNAV descent page, the first thing you'll notice is that the descent target speed is really slow. And using Costin X6, that is actually realistic. So that is how the um, 737 MAX just works. Let's go ahead and enter the descent wind forecast, and then we are going to go over the rest of our um, setup. So we're going to have flight level 200, 150 and 100 and then we have 306 at 19 we have 293 at 11 and then we have 265 at 9 okay looking good why do we only have the ISA deviation here and not the Q&H the real one had the Q&H in here as well Interesting. Okay, well, we'll just keep it at that. Transition level, I'll just enter something. Let's take flight level 80, because why not? Now let's go for the rest of the setup. If you go onto the approach reference page, you can see over here a couple of things. So, first of all, you have the frequency and the course. You also have the idens, which is uh, whiskey alpha over here. And just to let you know, off screen, 
I am checking the uh, chart right now to see if Whiskey Alpha is the correct ident. Now, let me see. Yes, Whiskey Alpha is the correct ident, so they've, they've done that one correctly. So, 3 to 6 on the courses. Three two six and three two six. So one one zero point three frequency. Make sure that you select the um, ILS mode over here. Otherwise, you are going to get into trouble um, because you will not be able to select an ILS frequency in the VOR. So if we try that down here on the VOR, you will see it just gives you an error. So that's not going to work. So be sure to select ILS and then you can enter it. All right, one one zero point three. And that's most of the setup already done. So let's go over a couple of details here. The minimum is 562. In the real plane, this is drag only. So looks like in the iFly you need to rotate it. Um, in the real one, you would drag it and hold it, similar to how PMDG have done it on their Boeing uh, 777. So that is probably a simplification to make it easier usable in um, flight simulation, but not 100% realistic. Okay, QNH 1011. Let's go ahead and dial that one in over here and over here. Okay, what else is there? Let's go ahead and play a little bit with the FMC. I want to see if I can get a couple of neat tricks from the real one to work. So we want to be sure that we are able to take the shortcut onto the ILS. So the final approach fix is Whiskey Alpha 529er. And we gotta be in 3000 over there. So first things first, 529er, 3000. Three degree glide path is also correct. So that's looking very good. Now, in order to get our vertical profile done correctly, let's go ahead and insert a little um, shortcut. So what I wanna do is, I wanna fly from a beam air leg to the final. So that means I'm gonna take the Adini waypoint, then type slash minus three, for example. Let's insert that. And now we've got that Eddy zero one point. Now let's put Alec behind that. And now the airplane is going to recalculate the vertical profile. Let's see what it calculates for Adi zero one. Or for Sophus for that matter. nothing. The real one would have done it by now. Well, it looks like this one actually doesn't do it. Okay. Well, that's a pity. In the real one, that's a really nice trick. You just enter that stuff without executing it, and then it does all the vertical calculation. You remember the um, constraint or the expected altitude that you would have had at the previous waypoint, or you just click next to it that would copy the restriction and the predicted altitude, not only the speed like this one did, so that's a bug there as well. And then you could just have erased that, uh, entered the altitude restriction and that's it. But looks like this one doesn't do it, so gotta click erase over here. We might be able to do another trick though, since iFly simulates the um, route 2 function of the flight plan. So let's just go ahead and make use of that. So, number one, route copy. Now let's do number two, and we had RD03 already created. Not in database. Did it not remember it? Normally it would, even without executing, but doesn't matter. Let's do it again. So RD01, and then we'll put Alec behind it. Well, execute. And now Sophos is at 6,000 feet. Okay. Well, that's fine. Heading select, route 2, activate, execute, and Sophos in 6000. Invalid entry. Why is that? Well, 6 0 should have worked as well. But it's okay, we'll leave it at that. Unable next altitude. Why? Don't tell me we've messed up the VNAV now. 
Let's see if we can reset it by re-entering the cruise altitude. That is the first thing I would do normally to fix any VNAV problems. Okay, looks like something went wrong over here. Like, look at that. Why does it want to be 6,000 at Repso? There's no reason to, do, to be there at that altitude. Let's delete it again. That does not look correct either. Okay, we botched the VNAV. Let's go back to route 1. Activate execute. Well, then we just gotta use that one. We wanna check how the rest of the aircraft works, so let's just keep going like this. Okay, well, let's go ahead and start our descent and see what we're up to. Of course, we had to cut a couple of corners right now because that um, vertical management didn't quite work as I would have expected, but let's not be too critical over here right now. This is a version 1.0 of the airplane after all, so let's not bother too much with it. Okay, starting the descent, and just to be sure, 300 is in here, that's good. Hold on, let's bring the VSD up. I kind of like this configuration in the real plane, even in the climb and in the cruise, because the nav display would just look like my standard 737NG nav display. So that kind of brought it back to what I was used to. Of course, when you're a pilot monitoring, then your setup would look like this, and this is quite awesome. Even with the VSD up, you have such a huge nav display. That's really wonderful. Those displays are really, really cool. All right, well, let's go ahead and finish our FMC setup. So progress page, we are burning 400 kilos, which is a landing weight of 59.6. Like that, we're gonna do a flap 30 landing, auto brakes three. And what's new on the max compared to the NG is on the approach ref page, you can see you've got two pages here now. So if you go to the next page, you can select the runway condition. And that is whether that's the reported braking action. It's a dry runway today, so we are going to select runway condition dry. And the reason the plane has this is because of the automatic overrun alert. So the airplane automatically monitors your energy state, and if it detects that you are running the risk of overrunning the runway, then it would tell it would give you an audio alert like max brakes, max reverse. So that's pretty cool stuff that Boeing have added. The 737 family has always been very prone to runway excursions, so Boeing have added quite a lot of new features to the um, to the 737 MAX in order to prevent that. And the runway overrun alert is just one of them. Okay, so let's go in, let's select the VSD up here, and here we go. I do have to admit this looks pretty cool. It's nice to see the MAX in our sim really nice by the way did you notice the um, difference in the sound of the wind as we're moving around the flight deck that's pretty cool and this view is as well I just love this view of those huge screens over here okay so while we're descending, let's just take a little tour around the cabin of the aircraft, because that is something I promised you earlier as well. So, off we go. And here we are. So we do have business class in this one. And, well, just a need-to-have feature. You can actually control those window, bl window uh, blinds. Pretty nice. Um, also, a very neat view out of the wing over here. Now, looking around those seats, nice level of detail, you, you can play around with it, I do like that. So you can take, for example, the um, table out over here, or if we go back to the economy class, I believe you can do that back there as well. Um, overall, those are some pretty neat things. Now, something I don't quite understand is, I do have the window blind control on automatic right now. I really don't know why they are completely closing them on our flight, but nonetheless, 
very nice view out on the wing of the Max. That winglet really looks awesome in the plane. Even though, I can tell you already that in the uh, real one, it's probably only a matter of time until the first couple of fuel trucks are gonna start hitting that um, lower part of the uh, scimitar over here. Probably only a question of time. But overall, it is really a very, very nicely looking aircraft. I've got to admit, it's excellent for screenshots as well, isn't it? I just love it. I just totally love it. Alright, well, let's go right back inside and let's go back up to the cockpit as we have a little bit more work to do in here. So, here we are in the cockpit and let's close that door. Okay, so, one thing you will notice with the MAX is that it, the MG doesn't descend very well, the MAX descends even worse, because of the high idle thrust that you have on those engines, and, well, kind of interesting to see that the speed is increasing all the way here. Now, something you can do in the real plane, if your speed is running off like that, it probably doesn't have the correct winds. So what you can do in the real one is you just re-enter the Direct 2 and that recalculates VNAV. I would have expected a greater change than this though. Well. So, in that case, um, of course I would just let the airplane run down like that because hey, that is our current energy state. There is no need to use the speed brakes right now. but. And that's the big but. Those speed brakes in the 737 MAX are fly-by-wire. And here's a little story from the real aircraft. So, on the 737 NG, those speed brakes are mechanical. And it does take a lot of force to use the lever properly. On the MAX, since they are fly-by-wire, the lever feels like cheap plastic to me. Sorry, Boeing, but that's my impression of that speed brake lever. On my very first MAX flight, I used the same amount of force that I was used to use from the NG. I pulled the lever up in order to get it out of the detent, I pulled it back, and I pulled it right across the flight detent all the way to up. Which is of course prohibited in flight, but it wasn't intentional, it was just using the same force that I had to use on the 800 was sufficient to bring that lever to the up position. When that happened, the airplane immediately started to bank significantly and started to shake itself. So, of course, I returned the lever immediately, but that was my first experience using the speed brake of the 737 MAX. Something that you really don't want to repeat, but they could have made a little remark in the book about that. Which they didn't at the time. I'm not sure if they added it right now. But that is really something you don't want to experience. Now, I talked earlier about my favorite feature of the Boeing 737 MAX. It's not the seatbelts, even though we are turning them on right now. No, it's that one. It's your flight number. Having that flight number available is just golden if you're doing four flights a day, 20 flights in five days, which was the standard at my former airline. Having that flight number is just golden. However, there's a little caveat to that, and that is, when you are landing the aircraft, a certain time after you have touched down, I think it's 60 seconds, but don't quote me on that, the FMC is going to delete any remains of the previous flight. And since that call sign is collected from the FMC, it means once you are vacating the runway, your call sign is going to vanish from the PFD. If you are over-reliant on that call sign, which I definitely was when I flew the MAX for the first couple of times, if you are over-reliant on that, you will be stuck without knowing your call sign. So do have it handy somewhere. That's a little um, thing that I hope is going to be updated throughout the lifespan of the 737 MAX. Um. But I'm pretty positive Boeing is actually going to update that because it is somewhat of a little threat to flight safety. Alright, so we're about to approach 10,000. Let's go right down to... What's our platform? 3,000. Okay, set Q&H. 
QNH 1011 cross check passing 12,100. Now. Okay, so let's see how good that speed brake is. Obviously, since our descent speed is calculated at less than 250 knots, there will be no deceleration segment over here, even though we are flying faster than 250 right now. For that reason, we'll have to help the plane a little bit and use the speed brake. Oh, what's it doing? Did I... did that go to... no. Speed brake, you are wrong. Flight detent. Here you go. And that's where it should be. Interesting. So we're actually able to pull the speed brake past the flight detent. Okay, I tell you what. If we're able to do that... Now I want to see if the airplane is actually going to um, experience that roll behavior that the real one had. So let's bring it back to a proper speed here. Okay, let's go speed brakes up. Don't don't ever do that, okay? No, okay. The real one would have done something like this. And really that fast. So don't do that, okay? Alright, let's stow those speed brakes. Bring the automation back in. Here we go. That's better. Alright guys, I was just tempted to see that in action. My apologies for um, all our passengers right here. Okay. So, here we are again. Let's go ahead and turn onto the downwind in a moment. Looks like that now that the speed has um, decreased properly, it is maintaining that rather good as well. I want to try something though. Let's go level change over here. Just maintain that current speed. So rate of descent over here about 1,300. That seems pretty, pretty accurate to me. Now let's go ahead and pull the speed brake and see how much of an effect that's going to have. I would expect something like 1,800, maybe 2,000. But no more than that. So, speed brake out. Flight detent only. Now let's see what kind of effect that has. Lost a bit, a little bit of speed. Let's wait until it has picked that up again. And let's wait until we are stabilized out of the turn. Yeah, that looks pretty accurate. 1800, 1900. Well, 2000 is a little bit too much. Okay, speed right back in again. And here we go. Interestingly enough, the VNAV path barely seemed to run off. That doesn't seem right to me. Let's put it back in a VNAV. We just descended a lot quicker than we should have. But. I would have expected to see us something like 500 to 1000 below the path, not 120. That's interesting. Let's see what it's going to do now. Okay, there is something wrong about the VNAV path here. It's doing a thousand feet a minute now and more or less mirroring the path, but... That doesn't seem right. Okay, reaching the decel point. And the speed bug just jumped down. It should have run down slowly, not just jumped to the new position. Okay, entering a couple of clouds. Engine anti ice on. Tie tie. That's thermal anti ice up here. Okay, so frisk check frequencies 110.3, which we have in here as well. Oh, I forgot to insert the rings. So runway 33. 
slash 10 and slash 4. Okay, Romy 33, 10 mil ring, 4 mil ring. Items. Why don't we receive the items yet? Should show those, shouldn't it? 1103 is up there. Strange, I'm fairly sure we should see the items here. Or do they only show once we turn inbound? I don't think so. As soon as we are in range, I believe it should show them. Well, we'll see once we are turning inbound. Okay, standby instruments are set and the courses 326. And just to be entirely sure, 110.3, that is in here. Interesting. Because latest on the standby instruments, we should definitely see the ILS indications right now. The PFD has a little bit of smart filtering depending on whether your track is within, or actually whether your heading is within 90 degrees of the runway heading, but the standby instrument doesn't have that. So on the standbys, we should most definitely see our ILS right now. Okay, speed is coming back, flaps one. Speed checked. Slowing down very well, probably a little bit too well here. Flaps one. The max should be a little bit more slippery than the NG. Okay, engine NTIs off. Especially with the NTIs on, by the way. Okay, there is something wrong with our radios here. We should most certainly get our ILS indication by now. Now that's going to be interesting to see. Flaps 5. Speed checked. Flaps 5. By the way, some of you might be wondering about our FMA over here. We've got LNAV active and LNAV armed. Now that is actually a feature and not a... Uh, where is it turning? Hello. Right hand turn, please. Right hand turn. Okay. Heading select. No idea why it's turning to the left now, and not to the right. Okay, heading 360, but we still don't get the ILS. What is it up to? What's going on here? 1103, and we have 1103. Is there any circuit breaker that's not in? Those are looking right. And... 25. Those are looking good as well. But there is nothing on the right side either. That would mean both CBs would have... No, 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 no. There is something wrong here. Now, just purely out of interest, if I hit the approach button... Okay, it doesn't arm. Well, that's correct. If we don't receive the ILS. Okay, I have no idea why, but there is our airport, and that means disconnect, recycle flight directors. Manual thrust, cleared visual approach. Okay, set run my track. 3 to 6 set. I have no idea why the ILS isn't working here. I do like the responsiveness of the engines over here. Well, it's probably still a bit too fast, but... Especially in the approach thrust range, jet engines do usually react very, very quickly. So, it's quite... It's 
quite um, good to see that we've got this fast reaction here. This is probably a bit too fast, especially if we're doing larger changes like this, but the engines should absolutely be rather quick here. Okay, gear down, flaps 15. Okay, speed breakers armed. One flaps down. 30. Checked. Gear up plus 5. Alright, now let's fly ourselves into the puppy and try to make this a proper landing. So, landing gear is down, flaps 30, and that's our most important landing checks complete here. And we might as well just turn the taxi light on. So a little bit of a mess the approach, I have to admit, but transitioning to visual on that short notice was a little bit unexpected. Alright, here we are, back on the puppy. You're still above the 500 foot gate, so technically speaking it's not an illegal approach. I, I do seem to recall we should need something about 50% N1 or so on the final. Let's just go ahead and set that. Something about here, 50%. Seems to work pretty nice in here as well. 300. Approaching minimum. Check. 200. Minimum. Continue. Speed break up, thrust was normal, 80%. Man, fairly effective braking here. Okay, manual brakes. Using reserve fuel. Well, not really. We got 2.4. Reserves would have been 2.0. But anyway, here we are. So, vacating the runway. And then we are going to do a little bit of housekeeping. And here's what I meant. When you're vacating and the FMC deletes the flight plan, you lose the call sign facility on your primary flight display. Need to see that they've modeled this quirk of the real aircraft. Okay, so, runway is vacated. Let's go ahead and tidy up for a bit. So, transponder off, flaps, up, speed brakes, up, then system page, auto brake off, and the standby off. So, lights off. Oh, we should have put these start switches to continuous. Well, it doesn't matter. Okay, APU on and pro beat auto. And last but not least, 3100. And let's turn one flight director off, hit level change, and that should reset the MCP speed down to 100. Here's a neat little feature you can use to make your life easier there. Okay, well, welcome to Warsaw. Let's taxi it to the gate, and then we'll do a little bit of a debriefing there. Suppose we're just going to go to the gate straight in front of us. Between the Emirates 777X and the Lot Dreamliner, looks like a good gate to me. Even though it's probably a heavy gate, well, let's, let's go to the right of it. And I'll tell you what, let's just try a single engine taxi. Number two, shut down. Then I'm just going to go a little bit further probably next to the lot over there, just to see how the airplane reacts on a single engine. And why are my flaps still on one? Let's go to up, please. Okay, 
Interesting, shutting down that engine didn't bring up any master caution, did it? Recall? Oh yeah. Here they are. Perfect. I might have cancelled them without looking at it. My mistake. Alright, so let's go to the gates to the uh, left of the other lot. So that's gonna be this one. Hello, go to the left please. I'm doing a full tiller input right now at three knots and the airplane isn't doing anything. Interesting. Okay, a little bit of power. Well, I have to admit, single engine taxi feels quite okay. The plane roundabout keeps its speed um, with the engine in idle, and it does accelerate rather fine on the remaining engine, even when you're across a turn, so that is quite good. Okay, here we are. So we have two blue, one red, engines dead. Coming through, all doors and park. Okay, so we are just going to leave it on um, the APU for now. And we have both engines below 20. Beacon off and transponder standby. Alright guys, so here we have it. Our first flight in the iFly Boeing 737 MAX. So, once again... As a reminder, this is a pre-release version, so this is not the final um, version of the aircraft that is going to release. Now, what's my first feedback over here? Well, it is a very good looking aircraft and it is a lot of fun to fly. Systems are there, I'd say like 80% or so. Um, small minor things, especially some that when you're used to the PMDG would be nice to have like the ability to do a little bit of those FMC tricks. However, Overall, it is really a lot of fun to fly this. Now, I have no idea why the ILS didn't work. I did fly that ILS with another aircraft about a week or two ago, so according to the scenery, at least it should be there. Um, so I really don't know what caused this. Anyway, on the next one, we are going to check out the Arnav approaches then. On this one, we just flew visual. A little bit low, um, but we corrected it above the 500-foot gate, so that was rather okay. In terms of the aircraft itself... There is still a little bit of work in progress going on, of course. For example, they are still um, going to add things like the 737H200, so the low-cost version, that can seat up to 200 passengers and stuff like that. But overall, I'd say my first impression is a pretty good one. It is a lot of fun to fly. It's very nice to see that we have a max at this level of fidelity in our simulator yet. And I'm really looking forward to do more flights with the iFly Boeing 737 MAX 8. Thank you very much for watching. I'm looking forward to welcoming you all again on the next one. In the meantime, be sure to like, comment and subscribe. And if you really love what I'm doing on this channel, I would appreciate a small donation through the Buy Me Coffee link in the video description below. Thank you for watching and see you all again on the next one.